Islamists are Muslim, but not all Muslims are Islamists. Okay? Uh, then the question of jihad comes up. People, it's, some people say, oh, jihad means this and jihad means that. Well, literally, jihad means struggle. And in the Quran, there are two kinds of struggle. There's jihad that's spiritual. Again, this struggle to get rid of the idol of self-sufficiency and instead attain a soul at peace in submission to Allah. That's spiritual jihad. But then there's also physical jihad, which is manifested in the world, um, manifested in the believer's life, and also the believer's life as it pits against unbelievers. Okay? And there are prescriptions for physical struggle against those who do not believe in Allah and do not submit to Allah. Um, Islam has to deal with jihad. Uh, that's all I'll say towards it. But jihad is something to be dealt with in Islam. Uh, there are plenty of verses in the Quran that can be taken towards the more uh, violent and physical end of jihad. There are plenty of verses that can be taken towards the more spiritual application or the less violent physical application of jihad. And that's something for, for Muslim theologians and Muslim practitioners to really hammer out uh, in the world today to try and prevent bloodshed and to prevent pain, evil, and suffering um, at the hands of their religion, which is meant to bring souls to peace in Allah. Uh, and this is the great divide of Islam. Uh, progressive and conservative and moderate Muslims, whatever you may call them, uh, whatever you may think of them as fundamentalists or Islamists or uh, good Muslims, bad Muslims, uh, let's try and not throw around terms. Let's just realize that there is a debate raging in Islam, just like there's a debate raging in a lot of other religions, um, and about how do we live out this religion today without forcing it on others, without harming others in the name of this religion. This is something that Christians deal with uh, throughout the world as well. Now, another major uh, point of contention um, with Islam as women is in Islam. As we mentioned earlier, the burqa ban in France is bringing this to the fore. Um, some women say the hijab or the burqa or the face covering and head covering um, is a sign of oppression. We saw that kind of in Afghanistan after Afghanistan was liberated and the Taliban was no longer in power. Women took off uh, the, the hijab as a sign that they were finally free. Now women in France are saying, hey, you're telling me I can't wear it? Well, a sign of my freedom is to wear it. And so, again, this debate raging in Islam is, is the hijab a sign of oppression or sign of liberation? Now, there are, uh, quote-unquote, feminist Muslims uh, who are fighting for more Muslim women's rights uh, to be able to, to show their bodies, to express their ideas and opinions, and they believe that Islam keeps them down and oppresses them and is patriarchal and uh, misogynist. And then there are other Muslim feminists who say that the Quran and the Hadith contain quantum leaps for women's rights. Again, an ongoing debate uh, in the religion of Islam. Uh, yes, the Quran does allow for polygamy or the taking of multiple wives. Uh, yes, there are some prescriptions in terms of men being able to hit uh, women um, in, in the Quran. Uh, these, are, these are things that Muslims need to deal with, things that Muslims need to discuss, uh, things that Muslims need to be honest about. Uh, but again, the same could be said for a lot of other religions. Uh, I can speak from my own experience with Christianity. Um, you know, we were just talking in my Old Testament class in my graduate program um, about how there are sections in the Old Testament uh, that seem to liberate women and speak of the strength of women and how their counsel can even change history. Then there are other sections that speak uh, quite low of women. And so we need to address those uh, in Christianity just as much as Islam needs to address them in their own faith. Now, how does Islam express itself in the world? Uh, this map kind of zeroes in on the Muslim world. Um, the darkest colors, uh, the really dark brown, is where 86% uh, of the population or more is Muslim. So you can kind of see that focused in on North Africa, Middle East. Um, and then 66 to 85% is kind of that tan color. Uh, you can see that again bounce, uh, bouncing up against the uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and you can see Indonesia. Um, then you can see kind of the yellows, a little less, oranges, a little less, and then the peaches, uh, a little less. But interesting, look at Austria, uh, look at France, uh, look at um, you know, Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. These are European countries where Muslim uh, faith is, is growing. Okay? The Islam is, is definitely growing. Also look at Africa. Uh, you know, if you were to color in those bottom countries that are, are gray, uh, those would probably be very Christian. Uh, now look at Indonesia. 
only 66 to 85 percent of the population in Indonesia is Muslim. Uh, a lot of other ones are, are a lot of other people in Indonesia are Christian. Um, but Indonesia is the most populous Muslim nation in the world. In fact, in the top 10, uh, only two of them are to be found in the Middle East. That's uh, Egypt, you could even say that's North Africa, and Iran, uh, where they have the most Muslims. Okay? Other countries include Nigeria, Algeria, and Morocco. That's uh, all in Africa. Uh, Turkey, which is kind of Middle East, kind of Europe, kind of uh, West Asia, Eurasia. Okay? Uh, and then in, in Asia itself, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Again, have a lot of Muslims by the numbers, maybe not per by percentage, but by the numbers. And then again, Indonesia, uh, semi-high percentage, major numbers of Muslims. How about in the United States? Uh, how many Muslims are here in the United States? Um, now, the, the story of Islam in the United States kind of starts with the slave trade. Uh, there are estimates that one out of every five slaves were Muslim, about 20%. Um, Muslims here in the United States, the numbers are growing day by day uh, because of immigration, because of procreation, and because of con uh, conversion as well. Um, there used to be this kind of understanding that most Muslims in the United States uh, were part of the Nation of Islam. We don't really have time to get into the Nation of Islam, but uh, it's a misnomer to say that most Muslims in the U.S., particularly African-American Muslims, are part of the Nation of Islam. The truth is that most Muslims here in the United States are Sunni Muslims, Again, uh, people that say that uh, political social leaders should be appointed based on merit, not by on relation to Muhammad, uh, and also believe that religious leaders should be appointed based on merit. Um, and the minority are Shia or Sufi or Nation of Islam uh, Muslims. Note some of the states and the cities that have a higher percentage. Again, looking at the brown, you're not looking at 88% of the population. You're looking at 04 to 0.8%. So always less than 1% of the population. But in places like California, Illinois, Ohio, New York, Massachusetts, uh, New Jersey, Rhode Island, you're approaching nearly 1% of the population being Muslim. Uh, in other places, you're looking at only half percent um, and lower. Now, of particular interest are some of the cities with high Muslim populations. The most significant Muslim population in the United States today is in Detroit. Uh, you go back there and places that used to be very Lutheran are now very Muslim. Other cities with high Muslim populations are your typical places of immigration. San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, Washington, D.C. Uh, but then there's this place down in the south, down in the heart of the Baptist country. Houston, uh, my hometown uh, right now, um, a large Muslim population, about 170,000 Muslims live here in Houston. Uh, that's out of the, uh, the 6 um, million people who live here. 170,000 Muslims is a lot of Muslims. And you'll see that. There are mosques, there are majids uh, in the suburbs and in the urban areas. Uh, so Islam is something to understand and something to converse with and dialogue with here in Houston, and indeed, uh, ever more so in the United States as a whole. In class today, uh, we're going to have the Reverend Agup Kowal, uh, who's from East Africa, and he's going to share about Islam in East Africa, uh, which is a little different than what we might see on TV, uh, showing from the Middle East. Okay, um, And then he's also going to talk about Muslim and Christian relations and dialogue. He's also going to talk a little bit about witnessing to Muslims. So we appreciated his visit uh, and his sharing today. Um, but uh, those who are online won't be able to hear that. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to contact me at ken at linkhouston.org. Again, um, and thank you for stopping by and, and listening to the class. I hope you learned something. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns uh, about what was presented um, today, uh, then I ask, ask you and encourage you to email me uh, to get in contact with me. Um, whether you're Christian, Muslim, atheist, whatever your background, uh, I'd love to talk to you about what was presented today. Um, I'm always seeking to learn more. If I presented something and you said, eh, that's not quite right, please uh, get in contact with me. I'd love to learn. I'd love to talk. Again, uh, my name is Ken Chitwood, uh, director of the Link Bible Institute, uh, presenting on Islam. It's part of our World Religions class uh, this spring semester. Every Tuesday, 7 to 9 p.m. at San Pedro Lutheran Church in downtown Houston. You can reach me at ken at linkhouston.org. Uh, thanks again, and I look forward uh, to hearing more uh, from you uh, in the future. And uh, next week we'll cover uh, Christianity and, and its variants. I look forward to 
sharing with you more then.